In the 11th chapter of Acts, beginning with verse 20, it says this, when they, that is, when Barnabas and, the, uh, and some of the disciples of Jesus were coming to Antioch, they spake unto the Grecians, preaching the Lord Jesus. And the hand of the Lord was with them, and a great number believed and turned unto the Lord. The tidings of these things came unto the ears of the church which were in Jerusalem, and they sent forth Barnabas that he should go as far as Antioch. Now Antioch was the third city in the Roman Empire. It was a very immoral and pagan and secular city, but it was a very important city. And when he came to Antioch and had seen the grace of God, he was glad, and he exhorted all that with purpose of heart they would come unto the Lord. For he was a good man and full of the Holy Ghost and of faith, and much people were added unto the Lord. But Barnabas thought he couldn't handle the situation alone because this was the first time that the gospel was going to the Gentiles. And so he went to Tarsus to seek Saul or Paul. And when he had found him, he brought him unto Antioch. And it came to pass that a whole year they assembled themselves with the church and taught much people. And the disciples were called Christians first in Antioch. The first time that they were ever called Christians was in Antioch. Now America and Britain and Australia and New Zealand and other countries of the world are call often called Christian countries. But what does the word Christian mean? When I was at Cambridge, a professor asked me during a question and answer period, what is a Christian in your definition? I had a film star on a, fil on a plane not long ago crossing America sitting beside me and he asked me when he saw me reading something out of the New Testament as we conversed he asked me what is a Christian I was in a prison visiting a famous criminal in America he asked me the same question business people housewives all sorts of people a soldier on a plane just recently asked me the same question and if you would ask that question I'm sure that you would give an answer now the early Christians did not choose this name. When Paul was converted, they were referred to as people of this way. Now Jesus had called his followers disciples. Now these two names, people of the way and disciples, were used for the first few years of the ministry following the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. But the world was trying to find a term to describe these strange people who were changed so dramatically in their beliefs and conduct. And finally there was one name that was attached to them at Antioch in the text we read that stuck to this day. The word Christian, Christ one, a follower of Christ. Now while a Christian is a religious person, a religious person is not necessarily a Christian. You say, well, certainly a person who prays is a Christian. No, because people all over the world pray. They pray to different gods, or they have different methods of prayer. Or you may say, well, I'm certain that a Christian is one who lives by the golden rule. I asked a leader in America a number of years ago his experience, and he said, well, I live by the golden rule. Now, what is the golden rule? You know what it is. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. But do you know anybody that's doing that? And then there are people who say, well, if you're sincere, isn't that enough? Sincere in what you believe. Sincere in the way you live. Well, the Bible says there's a way that seemeth right unto man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. You can go the wrong way. And there are many sincere people. But that's not the way to become a Christian. And that is not a Christian. Well, you say a Christian certainly is one who goes to church. Now Jesus had an encounter with Nicodemus who was a great leader, a religious leader. He prayed three times a day. He fasted twice a week. He gave 10% of all of his income to God's work. But Jesus said, Nicodemus, that's not enough. You must be born again if you're to see the kingdom of heaven. Well, then you say a Christian must be a person who keeps the Ten Commandments. No. A person could keep the Ten Commandments, but no one has ever done it. 
because the scripture says that if you keep all the commandments and break in one point, you're guilty of all, and all of us are guilty. And I'm convinced that thousands of people who've been baptized and confirmed and live a good life and are moral people have no personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Well, you say, what is a Christian then? Well, a true Christian is a person who believes. First, he believes that God is. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is. That out there and here, throughout the universe, there is God, the eternal, everlasting God, who had no beginning and no end. He is everlasting from everlasting God. And then secondly, he believes that God is love, that God loves him. The Bible teaches that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Yes, God loves you. And if you don't remember anything out of this mission, I hope you'll remember one thing. You are important to God and God loves you. No matter how many sins you've committed, no matter how bad you are, no matter what a hypocrite you may be, God loves you. And the third thing you must know is that you have sinned against God. You have sinned against God. Now you may not feel sin, you may not think about sin, you may not know that some of the things you are doing are sin, because you see the Bible says, in sin did my mother conceive me. We may not be conscious of that, but we are sinners even at birth. And then we become sinners when we reach the age of accountability. We become sinners by choice. And then we become sinners by practice. The way we live, the Bible teaches. And then the scripture says something that indicts all of us. In Romans 3.23 it says, all, that includes you, Whoever you are, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. We've come short of God's standards and we are under the threat of judgment. And the judgment is going to be death, natural death, spiritual death, eternal death. And the Bible says that sin must be forsaken. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts and let him return unto the Lord and he will have mercy upon him and to our God for he will abundantly pardon. Notice that. The wicked must forsake his way. Now the wicked means the sinner. You, me, we must forsake our way. We must even forsake some of our evil thoughts and we are to return to the Lord and he will have mercy upon us and he will abundantly pardon. It doesn't say that he'll just pardon. It says he will abundantly pardon. You see, when God forgives, he does more than we do when we forgive. God forgets. Now, the fourth thing that you must think about is, if you're going to be a Christian, you must believe that Jesus is the Son of God. Do you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God? That he's the way, the truth, and the life? He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh to the Father but by me. He said, there's only one entrance to the kingdom. Not two, not three, not four. One. And the door is very narrow. And the next thing you must believe is that Christ can save you. For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which is lost. The scripture says that when he was on the cross... He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. Now secondly, not only does a true Christian believe some of those things, but a true Christian is a person who has made a commitment. Paul and Silas, followers of Christ, were in a prison in Philippi one night. And the prison wall shook, an earthquake took place. And it looked as though the prisoners were going to escape and the jailer was frightened because he knew that the Roman authorities would hold him responsible if they escaped. But he had heard Paul and Silas singing. He had heard them testifying even though they had terrible wounds from their beatings. And he fell down before them and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they gave him a very simple answer. 
not something complicated, simple, so that nobody here can ever say that you, did, you couldn't do it. He, he said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Believe, commit your life to Christ and you shall be saved. It commits the believer wholeheartedly to one about whose person and work he has gained a clear-cut conviction. And it's so simple that millions stumble over it. People think it's so complicated to be a Christian, to be a true follower of Christ. No, it is not. You start out very simply. That first step is to say, Lord, I'm sorry for my sin. I turn from my sin. I receive Christ as my Lord and Savior. Now, two things are involved in believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. One is repentance. It means that you rethink. The word repentance means change. I change my attitude. I change my way of living. But you cannot change by yourself. You need God to help you to change. So he sends the Holy Spirit to help you in the changing process. And then secondly, it means trust. Faith is described in the Bible as the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Faith or belief is not faith without evidence, but commitment without reservation. It means that you hold nothing back. You totally commit this life, the future life, and everything you are or everything you hope to be to the person of Jesus Christ. Now living inside of you are three little men I like to describe sometimes. There's the intellect, the emotion, and the will. And all of them are involved in your commitment and your decision. The intellect looks at the evidence and says, I could believe as a step of faith. I don't understand it all, but I accept by faith. And then your emotion looks at the cross and says, I love him because he loved me. And then it's up to the will to make a decision. And the will has to say, I will receive him. I will trust him. And that's why I ask people to come forward publicly to make their commitment to Christ. Because every person in the New Testament that Jesus called, he called publicly. And he said, if you're not willing to acknowledge me before men, I'll not acknowledge you before my Father which is in heaven. And this is your hour and your moment of decision. What are you going to do about Jesus Christ? Though the New York primary election, the random killing in Jerusalem, the refueling of war in Lebanon, and the continued debate over gas warfare and the Iraq-Iranian war made headlines this past week, there was another headline that concerned Christians throughout America. The newspaper USA Today headlined it, Supreme Court Refuels Prayer Debate. The country has been caught up in an emotional debate during the past few months on the subject of prayer in the public schools. I have long advocated prayer in our schools, though I'm against the state writing and forcing such a prayer. Time after time, either the Congress or the Supreme Court has knocked down all suggestions and laws that would allow prayer in the schools. But the United States Supreme Court agreed Monday to consider an Alabama law that permits a moment of silence in public schools. The court agreed to review a lower court decision last year striking down the statute which is similar to laws in 22 other states. Over 12 years ago, I suggested in an address to an audience which included Chief Justice Berger and two other Supreme Court justices that we might hang the Ten Commandments in a scroll in every schoolroom in America. Our young people are having a difficult time deciding the difference between right and wrong. There is little moral law being taught in the schools. Many of our teachers are intimidated. They're afraid even to talk about philosophy for fear that they get into a discussion about God and the laws of God. After making that speech, I received a number of letters. One was from a theologian who said that the Ten Commandments were negative and outdated. He said the giver of those laws was a stern, wrathful God who angrily says to us, Thou shalt not. It's amazing to me how so much of modern education thinks of itself as having knowledge higher than God or God's laws. When we understand the Word of God, we find that God's truth 
is the most positive religion or philosophy there is. It eradicates fear. It is a way of faith. The Ten Commandments are both negative and positive. If we kept the Ten Commandments, we would develop a true character which would involve self-discipline. And of course, the Sermon on the Mount that Jesus gave is an explanation of the Ten Commandments. And the truly educated person is a self-disciplined person. Self-discipline involves self-restraint. To resist the lower impulses, to restrain the self from desires, habits, or customs that are contrary to the law of God. So man needs self-discipline to develop character. Secondly, it helps bring about a motivation to drive the self to do those things that ought to be done. In other words, there's a positive and a negative in the Ten Commandments. If we look at nature, we find both the positive and the negative, and the principle of opposites. Electricity functions and performs its work by use of both the positive and the negative. Some elements are alkaline, some are acid. Living things and beings in this world of matter are male and female. There are sins of both commission and omission. No basic law forming the basis of true character could be a perfect law unless it contained in perfect balance both positive and negative. The Ten Commandments are God's basic code upon which all His laws, social, economic, civil, and religious, hang. For example, the first commandment, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Here we have both the positive and the negative. Thou shalt is positive. No other gods indicates that we're to be restrained from false gods. This is the negative. We could take commandment after commandment and go through it all the same way. To the true God, man owes both worship and obedience. The principle of government is all the way through these commandments. The whole issue is one of government. The first man and woman rejected God's government, refused his rule over their laws, disobeyed the major points of the basic law of government. Christ came preaching the kingdom of God, which is the government of God, commanding humanity to repent of rejection of God's government and the transgressions of its laws. The Bible teaches that sin is a transgression of the law. These laws cover every area of our relationship. First, religious in our relationship to God. Second, family in our relationship to parents, children, wife, or husband, and is designed to preserve the sanctity and dignity of the home. Third, next door and personal neighbors and friends. Four, civil relationships. Here are found the very basic civil laws respecting murder, theft, adultery, and perjury. Five is economic life, honesty, not coveting other people's money, goods, properties, or possessions. Coveting is the very root source of today's economic principle of competition. Six, social life. Such commands as those respecting adultery, false witnessing, coveting, stealing, they form the foundational principle of right social attitudes and relationships with neighbors. Thus, the Bible teaches that this law is in its basic principles, defines the whole duty of man. It is the basis in principle for all the Bible. The Bible is, so far as its teaching is concerned, magnification in specific detail of these basic principles. This law is complete. It contains a brief summation principle, all the positive and negative obligations of the perfect, rightly balanced life. It is the very antithesis of permissiveness. It expresses and reflects the very character of God. To sum it all up, the Bible sums up the Ten Commandments with the word love. It is like God, for God is love. Just as His law is love, it was given in love for us. And love is the fulfilling of the law. It is love in action. It is love to God and love to neighbor. It is perfect and it is complete. These are the commandments that I would like to see hung in every classroom in America. I believe they would give a great impact on young people if they go through 12 grades seeing these commandments day after day and in classroom after classroom. Even having a perfect law and keeping such a perfect law could not save our souls. I don't want you to get me wrong. Keeping the Ten Commandments is impossible to start with, but if you kept them, that alone is not enough. And this comes as a great surprise to many people. The problem is that man is not constituted in such a way as to have the ability to obey the Ten Commandments or the Sermon on the Mount. The Scripture teaches that if we offend in one point, we're guilty of all. And since sin is a transgression of the law, 
we've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. But as complete and as wonderful as the law is, it cannot save the soul. The scriptures teach that if we're to have eternal life, we must have a righteousness which none of us has that is summed up in the law and the Sermon on the Mount. If righteousness could come by baptism, then Christ is dead in vain. If righteousness could come by ethical struggling, then Christ is dead in vain. If righteousness could come in any manner of form, ceremony, or liturgy, then Christ is dead in vain. If righteousness could be imparted by the dictum of any religious leader or any name or stamp, then Christ is dead in vain. In the book of Galatians, immediately after setting forth this idea, Paul writes in the next verse, as translated by Phillips, O oh, you dear idiots of Galatia, who has been casting a spell over you. Then he uses Abraham as an example. He said, even as Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness, know ye therefore that they which are of faith are the ones that have salvation. Thus the law in the sight of God was given in order to demonstrate to man that he could never do anything that could satisfy the perfect God who must demand perfection. The law is a mirror. When we look in that mirror, we see ourselves, and we see how far short we have come of God's perfection. I've already quoted James as saying, For whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend in one point is guilty of all. This establishes the fact that there's no such thing as a moderate sinner or a partial sinner. With God, there are no pastel shades. A person is saved or lost. He or she is under the blessing of salvation or under the curse of the law. He or she is declared righteous by grace, or he or she is declared accursed by the law. There's no third possible position. After this announcement, the passage in Galatians proceeds to set forth the vicarious death of the Lord Jesus Christ. Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is every one that hangeth on a tree. Here is the method by which a holy God is righteously able to take the sins of men and women and place them on a sinless Savior. When Jesus placed himself in the hands of men and allowed himself to be hung upon the cross, he became, even in the midst of his spotless perfection, in his sinless glory, a technical violator of that law. He was bearing your sins. He was made to be sin for us who knew no sin. And it was on this ground that God was able to pour the entire weight of sin upon the Savior. Thus it was that Christ was made sin for us. Thus the Scripture teaches, For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. While we cannot be saved by keeping the law, we can only be saved by repentance of our sins and faith in the Lord Jesus Christ who died on the cross. Yet the moral law, as expressed in the Ten Commandments and the Sermon on the Mount, is still a guide for us today. And it would be wonderful to have its text hanging in every schoolroom in America. I would like to ask two questions in closing today. I would like to ask, have you prayed and done something about having the Ten Commandments hung in the schoolrooms of America? And secondly, do you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Are you depending on some other road, some other thing to save your soul other than the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ and repentance of sin and faith in Him? If you are, you can receive Him today as your Lord and your Savior. 2 Corinthians, the fourth chapter. Therefore, since through God's mercy we have this ministry, we do not lose heart. Rather, we have renounced secret and shameful ways. We do not use deception, nor do we distort the Word of God. On the contrary, by setting forth the truth plainly, we commend ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. And even if our, go and even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled by those who are preaching. The God of this age hath blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. For we do not preach ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord, and ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. For God who said, Let the light shine in darkness, 
the same word that he said at the very beginning in Genesis, made his light to shine in our hearts as in the third chapter of John to Nicodemus, you must be born again. Made the light to shine in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. But we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. But I'm grateful for my longtime friend and president of our convention, Dr. Jim Henry, for the opportunity to address the convention during this special celebration, 150 years of Southern Baptist life. I preached at my first Southern Baptist convention in San Francisco at the Cow Palace in 1951, and I preached many times to this convention. I've been privileged to minister during more than one-third, think of it, I have lived long enough to preach to one-third of the history of Southern Baptist. And I've been heartened that in this convention you have been dealing with the struggle of racism and the issue of slavery in our history. Only when we individually as a corporate group renounce racism in all of its forms and repent of all transgressions will God ch choose to use us in the future to reach all people throughout the world. God help us to pull down the barriers that divide and to cooperate together to end racism and injustice wherever it may be found. We're here then to close this great convention on one majestic theme, empowered for the unfinished task. And my topic today, and I'm just now starting my talk, <laughs> my topic today is this, the person God will use for the unfinished task. What kind of a person ought you to be? What kind of a person should I be? I want to share some of my feelings of what I've learned in 50 years of preaching and observing the church of all denominations and all continents. I believe that we will minister together in one of the most difficult periods in history. It's coming up. A great crisis is approaching. I'm not going to say what it is because I don't know. But I know that in every area of life, something is happening that is frightening. Whatever area you look at, whether it's Middle Europe or whether it's Central Africa or whatever part of the world, people are fighting and they're hating and there's jealousy and there's fraud and there's greed and a lot of it is in our country. Thank God that the promise keepers are going to be here pretty soon in this stadium. And they're going to make some promises. God, who is always working in us and around us to give us life, apart from God, there's struggle. There's a void in the human heart. And when I preach, no matter where it is in the world, I can always count on five areas of human need that affect all people all over the world. These are the problems that face contemporary man. First, there's emptiness. Every audience I speak to, I know that there are people out there that are empty, especially young people. They keep crying for something, and they don't know what it is. They march, and they sing, and they have all kinds of music that my generation doesn't understand. We're changing our program a little bit on youth nights. Here in Atlanta, we did. The stadium was jammed and overflowing with young people, and we sang contemporary music. Because, you see, when I go to some country of the world, I have to speak through an interpreter. I don't know their language. I don't know the language of this new generation. I have to have an interpreter. And that interpreter sometimes can be music. And they'll listen, and then they're ready to hear the straight gospel of Christ. And when we gave the invitation here in this place, I think there was something like 10 or 12,000 people responded in one night to commit themselves to Christ. Yes, there's an emptiness. And then the, sec the second thing you find, not only emptiness, but you find loneliness. In American cities, millions live in huge 
multi-story buildings that are being called concrete jungles. Many of them are desperately lonely. People can be lonely in marriage, in the midst of a crowd, in the midst of a discotheque. They can be lonely. And people are suffering from what psychologists are beginning to call cosmic loneliness. We're a lonely people on a lonely planet in a lonely world. And then the third thing that I find in every audience is guilt. When I stand up to preach, I know there are certain people that feel guilty. And I can start right there if I have to. And you can't ignore guilt. It haunts us and hounds us. It tracks us down in the end and plays havoc with our peace of mind. We are guilty. We are guilty before God. All have sinned. And then there's the fear of death everywhere. Even for the Christian, there's a mystery to death. And many of you have held the hands of dying people this past year, or maybe this past month. And you know what it's like to be in the presence of death, and there's a mystery to it. And then you begin to wonder about your own death. The Bible tells us it's the last enemy. I'm looking forward to it. I really am. My wife said, please don't say that anymore. But I am. I'll be happy when the day comes when the Lord says, come on. I've got something better planned. I read in the Canadian Globe and Mail a story from Beijing, China where Kurt Coburn memorial concert was held this past April. And commemorating the first anniversary of the suicide of Coburn, the rock band Nirvana's lead singer, he said this, above the din, one could barely decipher the words in English, I don't care if I live or die. Many young people are like that. One 20-year-old at a concert said, we have the same depression, the same feelings as he felt in our society. People are living only for material things. They have no spirit. They just live for money. While the devil is at work, God is at work. The wheat and the tares are growing together. And I believe the wheat is going to overcome the tares. And we're going to see a mighty move of the Spirit of God before the end of the age comes. And then there's a deep-seated insecurity on the part of people that you stand up and talk to. Jesus said, man shall not live by bread alone. That's what we're trying to do in America. A man's life consisteth not in the abundance of the things that he possesses. Has any country ever possessed so much as we have? And yet we haven't found what we're looking for. We're still searching for something that's not there. And that something is Christ, that only Christ can fill. That's the reason, one reason we should be proclaiming his message. And one reason I'm so thrilled that the emphasis of Southern Baptist has always been on evangelism and missions. This is the kind of world that we are called to minister to. What kind of a man or woman should you be for God to use in this unfinished task when he said to go to the whole world and we haven't yet done that? First, I want to say to you, be sure you know Christ yourself. I've met too many people in the church and in the pulpit who have never been born again in my judgment. And they need the gospel and they need to respond to it. They're like Nicodemus. That's what ha that was what Nicodemus was like. Even some pastors and lay leaders. John Wesley, the founder of the Methodist Church, said, What a dreadful thing it would be for me if I should be ignorant of the power of the truth which I'm preparing to proclaim. 
Woe is me if I preach not the gospel. And I want to say to you, let's preach it and declare it with authority. And the authority comes from this book. Not... Don't get quite as heavy a book as this. I have two Bibles with me, and I picked up the wrong one this morning. I can hardly lift it. <laughs> Preach it with simplicity. Don't be afraid to be simple. I go to some of these big universities and read the paper after I've been there, and they talk about how simple I am. Well, I am consider that a compliment. And preach it with urgency. Declare it with urgency, even to your Sunday school class. Let them know that you really believe it and you want to receive them to come to Christ. And preach it to a decision. In Jacksonville, Florida, I read about a lifeguard suddenly jumping to his feet on the watchtower. And a man appeared to be struggling for his life in the water. And the lifeguard jumped down, grabbed a life buoy, and rushed out into the water with strong strokes, he swam toward the man. In a few seconds, sirens wailed as an ambulance came up and three other lifeguards swam out to help. They rescued the man, gave him artificial respiration. Scores of people gathered around. Everyone was deeply moved as the man revived. Scenes like that have been repeated over and over as lifeguards provide their service. In the main lifeguard station in Jacksonville, Florida today, you go there. There, hung, there hangs a sign with large red letters which reads, If in doubt, go. If there's any doubt in your mind about a man knowing Christ, speak to him. And let him see Christ in you. And then let's be men and women of prayer. Did you know that we've put all the emphasis in our crusades now on prayer? Because I am convinced that no evangelism is successful, no evangelism can be accomplished without prayer. And deep prayer and supplication. The prayers of Abraham and Jacob and Moses and Nehemiah and Daniel and Ezra, they changed the direction of a nation. They changed the history of the world. And it's always been interesting to me that when, they, when Jesus prayed in public, it was brief. With his disciples, it was a little longer. And when he prayed alone, it was all night. The development of koinonia comes through prayer. And you've heard the story of Joe Ulrich in Portland, Oregon, and how God laid it upon his heart to call the ministers of Portland together because nothing was happening in Portland. And 50 pastors accepted his invitation. And they just sat. They didn't know what to do or what to say. And on the third day, after praying, Conviction came upon those 50 pastors. No man preached and no man taught during that period. They just prayed, one after another. And there came a spirit of great revival among them. There was confession and repentance and obedience. Racial and denominational barriers fell and they left in unity. And this will have a far greater effect on bringing people to Christ than anything else is prayer. And we went there shortly thereafter and held a crusade, and you could sense the presence and power of God in that place. And just as the Apostle Paul wrote about the light that shines in the life of the Christian in the text that I read a moment ago, I do not believe that we should spend our time cursing the darkness. I don't believe we ought to spend our time pulling up the weeds. Let's let our light shine. And let's let the wheat grow and overcome the weeds. And that's, that's, that's what you've been doing in this convention. And let us leave Atlanta 
having celebrate our his, celebrated our history with an eye toward the future and the next generation and the next millennium. Let our lives be on fire for him until a spiritual fire can be seen throughout the world to the glory of God through the person of Jesus Christ. To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. God bless you and thank you for your patience. In the third chapter of Joel, the 13th verse, which you all know and most of you have preached from, put ye in the sickle, for the harvest is ripe. Come get you down, for the press is full, the vats overflow, for their wickedness is great. Multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision. And that is the situation, it seems to me, in the United States today. And it's the situation throughout the world. But Joel's vision was one of judgment. He was predicting under the spirit, the anointing of the Spirit of God that judgment was going to come. And it was going to be a fearful judgment. But he also saw something else. He saw that God was going to send a mighty spiritual awakening and revival among his people. And this is part of the passage that was quoted by Peter at Pentecost when the church was born. Joel did not understand how this prophecy would be fulfilled. What Joel foresaw was that in the fullness of time, judgment was going to come. And yet God was going to bring revival among his people. Yes, I believe it's possible to meet God's conditions and to have a spiritual awakening in your church. What are some of the barriers that I see here in Colorado for this crusade? Well, the society is much more mobile and complex than when we were here in 1965. Has it been 1965? My, I didn't know I was getting that old. <laughs> I've got 18 grandchildren, and I guess most of them were born since I was here. And then we have one great-grandchild on the way, so I may get here as a great-grandfather. But there are so many ideas and pressures on people's time today in comparison. Far more television and sports activities and motion pictures, vacation time. This is a great vacation area. And while most people are conscious of the churches, they've not really stopped to investigate the person of Christ. And that's what I find everywhere. People go to church, but they don't really know Christ in their hearts. But the greatest barrier that we face in Colorado is the devil. He's now in an all-out attack on the church and the spiritual renewal that has been underway since World War II. Many people are becoming cynical, especially of evangelism and evangelist. And then there are conditions which bring spiritual awakening. I don't believe that we can organize a revival. I don't believe you can organize a renewal or an awakening. But history has shown that some factors remain constant for every revival. First, there's the recognition of the sovereignty of God. The wind blows where it will. And then the second thing is a tremendous emphasis on prayer. Now, we've introduced here the, to you the uh, prayer triplet program. Maybe we were the first to introduce it, and maybe we weren't. Maybe it had already reached here, but we learned it in England about three years ago. They taught us over there. You get three people together, and each person gets three people. They begin to pray for those three people that do not know Christ. And one by one, those people come to Christ. They go and speak to them after they've prayed for them for three months. But prayer is, go is the secret. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. And Paul said, pray without ceasing. That means that we ought to be praying full time for this crusade. And like Jacob, wrestle with God in prayer. Have protracted prayer meetings. And say, Lord, I'll not let you go till you touch me and bless me until you bring revival to the city. If we had that kind of praying, from men and women who are totally yielded to Christ, you would see a mighty change in the city of Denver and the state of Colorado. And then a spirit of unity in Christ. Bishop Calde of Hungary, a Lutheran bishop, said, the closer we get to Christ, the closer we get to each other. Let's get close to Christ, and then we'll be closer to each other. But also diversity. We come from different backgrounds, slight differences in theology, here and there, and maybe great differences in theology here and there.
But whatever it is, if we're in Christ, we can all unite to win others to a saving knowledge of Christ. Then there's the clear preaching of the Word of God. And one of the emphasis I think that's needed in preaching today is repentance. We need repentance on the part of the Lord's people. On the part of people who claim to be Christians, we need repentance. We need repentance among pastors, among evangelists, among missionaries to turn from our worldliness and how quickly in an affluent society like ours, worldliness suddenly suddenly slips in. But the Word of God becomes a mirror, it becomes a hammer, and it breaks in pieces. It becomes a sword in our hands. I used to think that one of my jobs would be to go around the country and pull up the wheat and separate the wheat into tares. I changed my mind years ago and felt that I better stick to the gospel, proclaim the gospel, because there's where the power is, and not get involved in some of these other things. My business is to sow the word, so I'm not disturbed that the wheat and the tares are growing together, because the Lord is going to send his angels one day to separate him, and he'll make no mistakes. <laughs> now what, what, let's dream a moment. What could happen if we had a spiritual awakening in Colorado? First, moral reform. Time magazine in May, the 25th issue, had several articles, and most of its magazine was given over to ethics. And they stated in their time after time, as they quoted various sociologists and professors, that somewhere along the line we've lost our way morally. Now this is not a preacher. This is not a theologian writing. This is Time magazine, a great secular magazine, stating that we've lost our way morally and spiritually. And we need a reference point. We need to come back to something. And one man was quoted in there, said, we've left biblical principles. And as a result, we're reaping a whirlwind. Dorothy Sayers once said, we've been trying for years to uphold a particular standard of ethical values which derives from Christian dogma while gradually dispensing with the very dogma. I wrote a book three years ago entitled A Biblical Standard for Evangelists. I think we're going to give you one of those books today. We've offered it on our television this past week, and I, I didn't dream all these other things were going to take place at that time, but I was just getting what the Bible says as a standard for every clergyman and every evangelist. And we took 15 affirmations at our 1983 conference in Amsterdam for evangelists, and we made these affirmations, and I wrote a book on those 14, 15 statements. Awakening could also get our priorities straight. Many of us have put the cart before the horse. It would get us back to a more biblical message of holy living and discipleship. And one of the great burdens on my heart as I get older is discipleship. I myself want to be discipled more, and I want to pass on what I've learned to those others. We've often mistaken great social activism, which many people have mistakenly called evangelism. And while it goes hand in hand, because diakonia and kerygma go together, but kerygma comes first. A person has to be changed on the inside by the Holy Spirit when he repents of sin and by faith in what Christ did on the cross and rose again from the dead. Many people have gotten it backwards. Bishop Stephen Neal wrote a whole book on the subject. Thirdly, an awakening could be the basis of true ecumenism. There's a growing togetherness among people who believe in evangelism today. Fourthly, an awakening could present a challenge to our young people. Young people today want you to tell it like it is, and they can spot a phony and a hypocrite. They want reality. And thank God that thousands of them this summer in summer camps and Bible studies and prayer groups, it's a marvelous thing to see this new generation, how quickly they grow in the grace and knowledge of Christ and what God is doing at the universities. That's a whole nother story of the great university movements that are taking place in this country. Yes, man come of age responds to the proclamation of the gospel. And we must be open to new methods and new strategies. But genuine awakening, as I said a moment ago, cannot be organized. There must be the power of the Holy Spirit. I remember in our Berlin conference in 1966, a Korean preacher, pastor of the largest church in Korea, stood up and he preached a powerful sermon, and after almost every paragraph in that sermon, he would say, not by might nor by 
power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord. And after he was about halfway through his sermon, the whole audience, great theologians and clergy from all over the world in many languages, was saying it with him. Not by might, not by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord. Bob Dylan, several years ago, had a haunting folk song, and he raised the questions of how long man's inhumanity to man will last. And over and over the refrain went, The answer, my friend, is blowing in the wind. The answer, my friend, is blowing in the wind. It is the wind of God's spirit, or God's breath, that I'm praying will come to that mile-high stadium and sweep out across the state of Colorado. Now, no two revivals are exactly alike. Under Francis of Assisi, the appeal was in the realm of the affections. Under the reformers, it was more intellectual, a, revolution, a revelation and rediscovery of old theological truths. Under Wesley and Whitfield, the chief characteristic was the submission of the will to Christ. Under Charles Finney and Evan Roberts, it was a deep conviction of sin. But I say, let the wind blow, and let it blow where it will, but let it blow. Now I would like to ask the question, I've already gone too long. What can you as a pastor do between now and July 17? Or what can you as a lay leader in your church do? First, I would suggest that you have a vision for the crusade. Think beyond what you know you and your church can do. Think to the point when you say what God can do. Instill that vision in your people. Preach sermons on revival. Preach sermons on salvation. Preach on the great salvation themes of repentance and faith and the cross and the resurrection and the blood of Christ and being born again. Prepare your people. Secondly, prayer. Double your prayer efforts, especially as it relates to those unreached friends. Get involved in preparing for the nurture groups. Then Operation Andrew, which in some ways is almost parallel to the power of prayer in importance. We've found in recent years that only the churches that use Operation Andrew really get results. I want to emphasize that. Only the churches that use Operation Andrew really get the results. People can read the advertisements that will be in the newspapers or on television and not come. The advertisements make them aware and easier for them to say yes when they're invited. But nearly all the people that come forward to receive Christ in our crusades were invited by someone. Operation Andrew is successful only as a church becomes involved in group delegations. Why do we ask for a group delegation? Because you see, if you bring them in a bus or come in a group, we, we would like to see half of them, your church people who know Christ, and the other half, people that don't know Christ, they make a commitment to Christ, and on the way home, they have some people who can follow up. They can take them to your church. They can guide them and direct them and love them and instruct them. Prayer and Operation Andrew. Commit yourself to these next few weeks of cultivating your friends and bringing them that they might hear the gospel. As Andrew brought Peter, and I believe that all communities in Colorado can feel the effect of this crusade that begins on the 17th. I can hardly believe that it's such a short time away. I thank you for being here today. Thank God for you. We too will be praying. My wife and I will be on our knees many times praying for this forthcoming crusade. And I believe God is going to do far greater things than we can ask or expect. God bless you. I want you to turn with me, if you will, to the 10th chapter of Mark's Gospel. A very short uh, little story in the life of Jesus. A rich man came running to Jesus and kneeled down before him and said, Sir, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus told him to keep certain of the commandments. And... Uh, then after he said that he'd kept all those commandments and Jesus didn't name them all because nobody has ever kept the Ten Commandments. Nobody in the history of the world except Jesus ever kept all the Ten Commandments. Nobody in this audience. And if you've ever broken one commandment, you're called a sinner in the Bible. That's what sin is. 
It's a breaking of the law. It's coming a short of God's requirement for us. And Jesus said, one thing you lack, young man. Jesus loved him. He was a rich young man. And Jesus loved him. And Jesus said, one thing you lack, go your way, sell whatever you have and give it to the poor and take up the cross and follow me. And that young man, that word sad there could be translated, he was appalled. He was amazed at the answer of Jesus. You mean that I have to put Christ first over all my possessions? over everything and I've got houses and lands and bank accounts I've got it all but Jesus is demanding that I take up a cross now a cross in those days was the same as saying take up the electric chair and follow me because there was a place where the Romans executed criminals and Jesus was headed toward the cross and I want to speak tonight just briefly on the high cost of low living you remember on D-Day? Some of you don't remember that, of course. Most of you don't. I do. Eisenhower said to the troops on D-Day when they invaded Europe, there is no victory at bargain prices. Now, I don't know how you are, but my wife is always looking for a bargain. She'll go clear across town and spend maybe 40 or 50 cents to save five cents. In athletics, there are no shortcuts to success. It's so uh, it's it's a little bit frightening when the sports researcher Robert Goldman polled 198 world-class athletes, asking, "Would you take a pill that would guarantee a gold medal, even if you knew that it would kill you in five years?" Do you know what the answer was? More than half said they'd do it. In other words. They want athletic success and they want that gold medal more than they want life itself. In education, there are no shortcuts. This is a great university, one of the greatest in the country that we're on here. Dr. Holderman and his wife came and visited my wife and me for a cup of coffee this morning and we had a wonderful time together. But there are no shortcuts. Then there are people that are using drugs, and many of them are beginning to say in TV ads, it's not worth it. We pay a terrible price for crime, especially that's been induced by illegal drugs and alcohol abuse. Governor Bill Clinton said the other day in a speech that half of the Americans in prison are there because of alcohol and drug abuse. And that sums up to a quarter of a million people. Then Dr. David Lewis of Brown University said the other day that fully 20% of hospital patients are there because of alcohol and drug abuse. And it costs billions of dollars to the American taxpayer. Now the first point I'd like to make is the high price of sin. The Bible says the wages of sin is death. The Bible says whatsoever a man soweth that shall he also reap. Whatever you've been sowing, someday you're going to reap it. You'll reap it in this life and you'll reap it at the judgment. Job said, even as I've seen, they that plow iniquity and sow wickedness reap the same. In Proverbs 1, it says, Therefore shall they eat of the fruit of their own way and be filled with their own devices. Ann Landers last month published a letter for a man who signed himself hurting in Chicago. And here's how the letter read. I need some kind of help desperately. Please come to my rescue. I'm a 35-year-old married man with three kids. I gamble every day and am in great financial trouble. My family doesn't know. I lie to everyone to cover up. The bill collectors keep calling and all we do is fight. After every loss, I promise myself I'll never gamble again. But a few days, I'm back placing bets, shooting craps and playing poker. Please help me, or I'm going to kill myself. In Proverbs 5, it says, The evil deeds of a wicked man ensnare him. The cords of sin hold him fast. I heard many years ago, I read a story about a great chain maker. 
and uh, his king asked him if he would make the strongest chain he'd ever make that would bind anybody and hold anybody. So he went and he forged the greatest and strongest chain he'd ever made. And when he brought it to the king, the king said, Will that hold any man, no matter how strong he is, you can tie him in that chain and he can't get loose? He said, yes, sir, I guarantee it. The king ordered the man arrested and had him chained. He had forged his own chain. And you're now forging links of a chain which will someday bind you. You don't think so now. Many of you are young. I want to ask, how many of you are under 30 years of age you are here tonight? Stand up. You're under 30. My goodness, I should have asked if there's anybody over 30 here. We welcome you. So I want to ask you tonight this question. Is it worth gaining popularity and losing the smile of God? Is it worth gaining pleasure and success and losing your soul? Is it worth being successful if you've lost your soul? Jesus said, what shall it profit a man if he gained the whole world and lose his soul? Suppose you gained everything that athlete and the athletic world has to offer. Or suppose you gained everything that money can buy. Is it worth it if you have lost the possibility of fellowship with God? You cannot buy sin for cash. It's only bought on the installment plan. A girl said she suffered for eight years in a letter to us because of yielding to the temptation of a moment. She had an illegitimate child. She lost the boy she was really in love with. And the end result was that she sunk into the lowest depths and turned to drugs. Was it worth it? That one moment that she gave in just before coming to Columbia, I received a letter from a 17-year-old girl and uh, she had watched us from out from Tallahassee on the television and she said when I was 15 years old my boyfriend forced me to have sex with him I knew it was against my beliefs and morals I still let the peer pressure win me over I was too young to really know that if somebody truly loves you they don't force such personal things onto you I was afraid so I gave in I've never felt such guilt. I couldn't look him in the face. I couldn't look myself in the mirror or my parents or friends in the eye. Worst of all, I couldn't talk to God. I feel like I've betrayed God and my husband I've betrayed that someday I may marry. She watched the last telecast from Tallahassee and a sermon that I had preached on the consequences of sex and immorality. And she wrote, we teens need to be spoken to that way. Not many adults take the time to understand this, so help. Your sermon helped me to see that I'm human and do make mistakes, and the Lord does forgive, and I'm not a total outcast. Yes, God forgives. That's why Christ came and died on the cross, so you can have forgiveness. That's how we're saved, is coming to the cross. And the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses from all sin, any sin you can find forgiveness tonight, whatever it may be. Was it worth it to that girl? A rich man in Texas that I talked to was bitter, confused, and frustrated. And sitting on his mi millions, he was miserable and unhappy when he died on his deathbed. He said, I'm lost. I'm lost. I'm going to hell. He said, I'd give all my money if God would just spare me six more weeks so I could find God and be saved, but it's too late. You see, self-indulgence is never fulfilling. A business psychology appearing on CNN said that a survey revealed that 60% of young men who start from zero and build up to making a million dollars a year or more are disillusioned about the fact that money has not brought them fulfillment. Is it worth it? We haven't learned that, that godliness with contentment is great gain. 
According to a survey conducted by Money Magazine, it says, money causes more arguments in United States households than any other topic in all income groups. And it's because of selfishness. Is it worth it? And yet, how many people are striving to gain that extra dollar to make that extra little bit of money in any way they can? And we overlook the fact that there's a very high price to low living. Too many think that you can go out and sow your wild oats all week, then head for church on Sunday and everything will be okay. It's not okay. You're a hypocrite. And Jesus condemned the hypocrites more than anybody else. The whole 23rd chapter of Matthew, read it sometime, the names he called hypocrites. How many of us wear a mask? It's like the story about the fellow that was out of a job and he finally landed a job at a zoo. And they said, we put on a show every week. We have a circus that comes out from the zoo and uh, our gorilla has died. And we've skinned him and we'd like to put his skin on you and you be the gorilla. And all you have to do is just eat the peanuts and just grunt and growl at the people and fr try to frighten them a little bit and put on a show in your cage. Well, he didn't have any other job and they were paying good wages. He said, okay, I'll try it. So he did. And he was having a big time. But one day he slipped and he fell in the lion's cage. And this lion roared at him and he backed up and he began to yell, help, 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 help. And the lion said, shut up, you fool. We'll both lose our jobs. <laughs> but we wear a mask. Many of us wear a mask. Our true identity is deep down inside and only God knows it. And God says we're sinners or we're hypocrites. We need to repent and turn by faith to Jesus Christ. Too many think that you can live any way you like and get away with it, but you can't. Be sure your sin will find you out. A famous talk show host quoted the statistic some time ago that 27% of all of every entertainment dollar in America is spent to stimulate sexual thrills that run into the hundreds of billions annually. And Americans wish they had more money to spend on sex. According to a research report entitled Americans and Their Money in Money Magazine, a third of adult Americans think that if they had a fatter wallet, more money, they'd have better sex. Is it worth it? There was a beautiful star I read about the other day in Europe. She's hiding. She said, I don't want fans to watch me age. I'll never give another interview or pose for another picture. Let me tell you, it soon is over. And it's not long till you have a day of reckoning. The world's stars burn out. Its idols fall. Its favorites wane. Its glamour fades. Its popularity passes. Its days are numbered. The world system as we know it is passing away. And only you that know Christ and are doing the will of God are going to last forever. Satan, of course, will seek to trap you. Now, what is the world system? When we talk about the world system being against us, what does that really mean? It means the persons, the places, the pursuits, the pleasures from which God is left out. If God's left out of any phase of your life, that's a part of the world system. And it says the world system is controlled by the devil. He's the prince and power of the air. It's the system of evil that undergirds the world. Not everything in the world is bad. That's not what I'm talking about. I mean there's a, there's a, a, a system that the devil himself runs. And the Bible says that this world system is controlled by the devil and deceives the whole world. There's a new book out. It says that 70% of successful people suffer from the impossible phenomenon. Do you know what it is? Even though they're admired and respected, they're afraid that someday they're going to be found out. There are secrets that you are hiding. The Bible calls them secret sins. 
You don't want to be found out. The Bible talks about the world as being the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life. The word lust means desire, selfish desire, almost uncontrollable desire. And this may be in the physical realm or it may be in, the, in our imagination. The lust of the eyes could be daydreaming. That's the reason Job said, I made a covenant with my eyes not to look lustfully at a girl. And in the realm of ambition, the pride of life, in other words, to be the big star, to be the big cheese in your group, at your office, or in your neighborhood, or in your family. It's not worth paying the price. It's too high. First, there's the high price of sin. Then secondly, there's the high price of salvation. When you come to Jesus Christ, it cost God everything. It cost God his son. Can you imagine how God felt watching his son die on that cross and watch those soldiers nail those nails in his hands and pierce his brow with a thorn crown? Can you imagine how God felt when he said, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And Jesus became guilty of your sins and of your sins and your sins and my sins. He bore our sins. We don't understand it. No theologian can explain it all. But in some mysterious, wonderful way, God placed upon Christ our sins. And you must respond by repentance. What is repentance? It means that you change your way of thinking. You change your way of living. It means that you're willing to turn over your life to Christ, turn over your life to God and say, Oh God, I need you. I receive you. And then by faith you receive Christ. And the word faith means commitment. You commit your life to Christ as your Savior and your Lord. Oh, you say, Billy, I'm, I've been in the church and I try to go to church and I've been baptized and all that. And one night in a meeting just like this, I made a commitment to Christ and it changed my life. It cost God his son because you were redeemed not with silver and gold, but with the precious blood of Christ. God paid the price for you. And it's by grace. You don't deserve it. When the Grammy Awards were given out earlier this year, the album of the year, I think, was entitled Graceland. And every believer in Christ lives in grace land because grace means Christ unmerited favor to the undeserving. The Apostle Paul wrote, Ye know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that ye through his poverty might be rich. You see, Jesus Christ made the supreme sacrifice on the cross for your pardon and your salvation. And you don't deserve it. I deserve judgment in hell, and so do you. But Christ paid the price for me. And now if I come to him... God applies what he did on the cross to me. And God doesn't see my sins. He sees what Christ did. Then lastly, there's the high price of commitment. You must pay a high price. This young ruler wanted Jesus to compromise, but Jesus will not water down the message and Jesus will not compromise. Even though he lost a disciple, he never offered a bargain. This rich young man sold out from a triumphant to a tragic life because he was so near to life and yet so far. So rich and yet so poor. So good and yet so bad. And so wise and yet so foolish. All because he walked away from commitment to Jesus Christ. The Bible said, Jesus himself said, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself, take up the cross and follow me. That means to deny your own selfish desires. It means to put Christ first in your life. It may cost some friends. It may mean misunderstanding. It may mean that you'll have to change your career. There was a man in England, he was a famous sportsman, captain of the Cambridge 11 cricket team. He gave away his vast wealth to needy causes a century ago. 
and he went to China and his slogan was, if Jesus Christ be God and died for me, then no sacrifice can be too great for me to make for him. Charles Borden was one of the wealthy men of America at Yale University. He was heir to one of the greatest fortunes in the country. He decided he was going to be a missionary. And he went toward China to be a missionary. He died in Egypt of typhoid fever on the way. And he wrote this, no reserves, no retreat, no regrets. Even though I died in early age and even though I left my millions behind, I have no regrets. I'd do it all over again. Eric Little, you saw chariots of fire and the price he paid. And yet, at the end of the story, that's not the end of the story that you saw in the film. He went on to China to be a missionary and he died in a Japanese concentration camp. Paying the price of following Christ. Would you do that? For Christ, Jim Elliot, a generation ago, went to the same college that I did a little bit after me. He became a missionary to the Alka Indians in South America. He was killed by them. Before he died, he had written, He is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. This rich young ruler went away from Jesus grieved. In a column I read the other day, it says, Today is the first day of the rest of your life. In fact, it is the initial moment of your whole eternity. Tonight, you can make that commitment and begin a whole new life. A 28-year-old man came to the meeting earlier this week and he said that he had recently attended a funeral and realized that he didn't know where he would spend eternity. And he came here and he listened to the message and came forward and received Christ. A high school girl who attends a school where several tragedies in the past have claimed the lives of students said, we've had so much in my school, I might be next. She came here the other night and made her commitment to Christ. You can do the same tonight, right now.